So push it. Push race it. If you asked the general public for their associations with marketing, okay, what three things come to mind when you think of marketing? I suspect the answer would be mildly negative. Yeah, selling, selling me stuff I don't really want, adverts that get in the way when I'm trying to watch Netflix or whatever it might be. I mean, not as bad as banking, but generally mildly negative. And I thought, but hang on, marketing at its best, when it's at its very best, it creates whole companies, brands, jobs, and becomes part of culture. It actually, marketing at its best makes a difference. Unfortunately, as you can uh, perhaps see from the chart, even those at the back, according to our figures, only 4% of marketing is five-star, is that sort of marketing that makes a difference. 4%. Yeah? And we need more of it. At the other end of the spectrum, one-star marketing achieves precisely nothing. You may as well have made a bonfire of the money and burnt it, let alone all the time and talent. And that is about a third, a third of all advertising, this is the advertising shape, achieves precisely nothing. Now, $660 billion is spent annually on making and airing advertising. Yeah? $660 billion. So if a third of it is incinerated, it achieves nothing, $220 billion is just incinerated. Okay? And I think in the 21st century, that's not acceptable. That's just not acceptable. You know, I was listening to a program last week. I think something like 800 million people in India have no access to a toilet. How many toilets could you buy with 220 billion? I mean, there's a better use of the, uh, the money. And 660 billion, by the way, if Adland was a country, it would be the 19th largest GDP in the world. Okay, just behind Saudi Arabia and ahead of Switzerland. And the savings alone of never doing one-star advertising ever again, I think is more than the GDP of New Zealand. So, this stuff matters. And I sort of think, how can we as an industry basically delete the old ways of thinking and be, have the courage to try something new so that we can actually do more marketing that makes a difference and stop incinerating money? And I suppose to make it real, in our industry, you know that idea that 50% of my marketing budget's wasted, I just don't know which half. That's the sort of idea I think we need to delete. <laughs> delete. Because it's nonsense. You can actually predict this stuff, you can measure it, and you can do better. Now, there are all sorts of other reasons why we still end up putting out stuff into the market that's not going to have the impact, which I will come on to. What we've got to do is that. Basically, we've got to do... We've ne never do anything less than three stars. As long as it's three stars and above, it will have profitable growth impact, OK? Nice and simple. I joined Unilever. That was my marketing training. And then, and I still think today, there's a notion of the way that marketing works, we get to the psychology bit now, that marketing basically is based on a left brain, right brain model of how we make decisions, how human beings make decisions. So roughly, roughly, marketing is 50% rational, 50% emotional. And the best metaphor that I've ever heard for, let's call it the 20th century school of marketing, is that great marketing is like a fist of a brand proposition, the USP, wrapped in a velvet glove of emotion. So the velvet glove is what we lure people towards us, and then we can hit them with why our brand is vastly superior to all those other brands and persuade people to buy. It's essentially a persuasion-based model, because that's how we think it works. Except it doesn't. So who in the room 
owns a copy? Let's do it this way. Who in the room owns a copy of Daniel Kahneman and Tversky's Thinking Fast and Slow? All right, keep, okay, keep your hand up if you finished it. <laughs> that book, so Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for economics. He's a psychologist. That book is apparently the second most bought, least finished book in the world. <laughs> Does anyone know what the number one bought least finished book is? The Bible? No, no. Any other takers? A Brief History of Time. You know the Stephen, Haw Stephen Hawkins? Apparently the British publishers put um, a little post-it note on page 167, which said, uh, if you've reached this page, phone this number and we'll give you 50 pounds. <laughs> And they did not get very many calls. <laughs> anyway, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow puts forward the idea that our brains are better thought of as split into system one and system two. System one, because it was the original human brain. And I always think that the best way of thinking about it is it's located here, <laughs> okay? Because it's basically instinctive emotional intu intuition. It's the gut feel, it's our kind of emotional reactions to things. And system two is the slow thinking, clever bit, but it, and that's up here. Okay, so it's cognitive, slow, mathematical, deliberative, and it's amazing, it's amazing that we can do it. You know, it's, it's a human quality. But here's the rub, okay. If we split system one and system two into computing power, System two, the clever, rational, cognitive bit, would be about 50 bits of computing power. And system one, okay, here, the emotional, instinctive, intuitive bit, would be 11 million bits. System two, the clever bit, okay, 50. System one, emotional, instinctive, etc., 11 million. That is why this, t this talk is entitled we think much less than we think we think. Because system one is how we make pretty much every decision in every circumstance. And guess what we use system two to do? Post-rationalize decisions we've made over there. Now, if any of you are doubting this, or maybe you work in a category where you think, you know, it's much more rational in my category, I give you this just as an analogy. Buying a house is probably the biggest purchase any of us will make in a lifetime, okay? And we try and put our system two head on, and we make a list of, you know, how many rooms, where's it got to be, um, what is our maximum budget, okay? All of you who've bought a house have been through this. You go into the estate agent or the realtor, I'm not sure what they call in Australia, uh, and you give them the brief. And then, damn them, they always show you places that do not fit the brief. And the reason is because they are going on experience. They know from experience that you will not buy the house that you thought you were going to buy because as you're going round, you basically come across one and you go, this is it, this is it, I love this one, I love this house, I love this house, the fact that it's more than the budget that we, uh, you know, we said. So you will, everybody, overpays or pays more than their maximum budget when you're buying a house because it's system one. And then we will find a nice uh, system two rationale for, for why we do it, okay? So, there we go. System one rules the roost. Australia is the home of um, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute and the work that they are doing is fantastic, phenomenal, and it's helping educate everyone around the world that the way that brands grow, okay, we all basically choose between three or four in any category in which we buy that category a lot, yeah? Now, so it's not differentiation and product superiority that builds lots of brands, and if you're brand leader, it does not mean that you have more loyal, you know, you, you, all of your customers are loyal. No, we basically choose between three or four. Now, loyalty exists, but basically, it's pretty fixed. 
you can't really change loyalty. So the number one brand in any market has slightly more loyalty than the number two. It has slightly more loyalty than the number three. The thing that matters in terms of building any brand in any category are the following three things. Neil had three Fs. I think, why not? Why can't I? Okay. Fame. So basically, the quicker a brand comes to mind, the more kind of you know, the more you know about it, the better the decision. Feeling, if you feel good about a brand, it's a good decision. Okay? Just basically, the more I feel good about something, the more I trust it, the more I think it's great, I assign it with all sorts of wonderful things. And fluency. Fluency is distinctiveness, not differentiation and product superiority. So Apple Y earbuds make it distinctive. They're not even very good earbuds. You know, Red Bull diminutive can makes it distinctive. Distinctiveness much more important than differentiation. The USP is one of those 20th century ideas that needs to be deleted. Delete. Okay. How you measure it? You just get people to basically spontaneously, which brands come to mind when you say soft drinks or beer? Measure emotion, various ways of measuring it, but this is the way we do it. And fluency is under time pressure, what do you associate with what? The reason it matters is because big brands have lots of fame, feeling, and fluency. Small brands have very little. If you're growing, you're basically your feeling and fluency will be growing. And if you're declining, you're a big brand, but it's declining, you'll be losing feeling. Advertising. Right. Now, the short version of this, which is in the back of the book, is the more people feel, the more people buy. Not about message, not about content, it's about making people feel something. A little demonstration. As we heard earlier, it was um, Shadi's birthday uh, today. Yeah? So if you'll indulge me, we're going to sing Happy birthday to Sade, okay? If you're all ready, after three, one, two, three. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yay! <laughs> you see, are you feeling good? Happy birthday is the most sung song in the world, okay? It's a meme, you know, for those of you who are into memes, the idea that spreads itself. The act of singing it teaches it, and uh, it's pure emotion. It's emotional to be on the receiving end of it, and it's emotional to sing it. It's quite nice. We just like it. Emotions and copying is what human beings need most, do most, and there's almost no limit to how much emotion we can consume, unlike most categories. There is a limit of, uh, of how much we can consume. So, the technical bit. The IPA, which I think Neil mentioned earlier, so the Institute of Practitioners of Advertising in the UK, have done some amazing work, um, Les Binet and Peter Field, on the long and the short effects of advertising. Okay. Now, long-term advertising that creates the most sustainable profitability is pure emotion. Almost no message, no kind of product features. It's those ads that we, you know, become famous and that we love. Short-term advertising tends to be message-based, features rich, and it can have an ROI, it's not that it, it, it can't or doesn't, but basically it's a bit like a promotion. It goes up and then comes pretty much down to where it was before you spent it. Long-term profitability is basically created through emotional advertising. The more people feel, the more people buy. And I know we all are feeling the pressure, smaller budgets, zero-based budgeting, you know, that pressure to justify what we're doing. And so there's basically been an increase in the amount of short-term, message-based, sales-orientated advertising. And guess what? Creativity is declining, and so is profitability, long-term profitability. 
as John encouraged us, there are a few things we need to delete. Okay, we need to delete some of the dialogue that's going on and have the courage to basically try. The thing about long-term advertising is it takes nine to 12 months to work. Just a few thoughts on how to be brave, how to do five-star advertising and more marketing that makes a difference. So, I'm going to start here. <coughs> I was having a chat with um, at, uh, someone Jamie will know, uh, BV Pradeep at uh, Unilever, who's pretty straight, serious, you know, market researcher. And he was saying, well, how do you get agencies and creatives to embrace testing? Okay? Because creativity and creatives and market research testing are like oil and water. Never the two, you know, they basically hate each other sort of thing. Yeah? And it was like, okay, well, first of all, you have to basically test everything and test early. Okay? So you have to have a sort of philosophy, like we've heard this morning, generate, test, fail, and learn. You have to have a sort of feedback loop in order to, you know, make progress. You have to have a way of testing which actually measures the thing that creatives are trying to produce, which is emotion. They're trying to get an emotional reaction. Okay. Then what you have to do is you have to show the creatives that this method, they take adverts that they really admire and show that they were predicted and predictable, that you can actually measure the stuff that they want to do. What you also have to do is show them ads that they really admire, which were a disaster commercially. Because this is the magic bit, and you have to explain why. So earlier on, Shadi was um, sharing some of the Harvey Nichols stuff, Bo, the 100-year-old model, uh, and the cartoon faces of the shoplifters. So we tested um, the shoplifters one, and that was a high four-star. Really good. People got it. But Harvey Nichols also did another ad recently, two Christmases ago, called... Um, I would have bought you something nice, but I spent it on myself, okay? And I love this ad too, by the way. And it was basically people giving gifts of paper clips and rubber bands to, you know, their loved ones while they sat there in their new jumper or their new shoes. And it was funny. It was really funny. And it won a can gold. One star. One star. Why? It's Christmas. It's the wrong sentiment. So we in the industry loved it because it was sort of anti the John Lewis schmaltzy type stuff. It was a bit different and no, it didn't work. And it didn't work uh, commercially. And that's the thing. Creatives basically are using novelty as a proxy for commercial success. And it's like it can work like that, but not always, okay? So before any of us, I mean, we talk about judgment a lot. So again, Ehrenberg Bass have just um, put out a brilliant paper where they rated chief marketing officers' ability to judge advertising. And it was based on um, single source data over long periods of time in terms of the profitability. Okay, so here's the bad news. CMOs are no better than random at predicting which ads are going to be the commercial hits and or misses. Now, before the creatives in the room get too excited, we tested 100 can award winners, okay? A third, a third, a third, bronze, silver, and gold, all of which um, had uh, IPA type effectiveness data. And I'm afraid, although creatives, I mean, these are the best creatives in the world, they did choose the four- and five-star ads twice as often as the norm. So that's the good news. But they also chose one-star ads significantly more than the norm because they were the sort of ads like Harvey Nichols that were kind of distinctive and different and funny, but disastrous. So the reason I've got a picture of sperm and a baby up here is because B.V. Pradeep gave me this glorious analogy, which I'm indebted to him for. Um, he was like, oh, it's the difference between sperm and a baby in terms of if you test everything, test early, and you can reject stuff when it's early on. Creatives can get excited about an idea, but they will let it go if it's early. Whereas if you and the team, if the client team and the agency have been working on something for a year, 
and you get a bad result, you can't kill the baby. It's a baby. And basically, all of the effort on both the agency and the client side will go into why the research is utter shite, it doesn't matter, it's going to be huge, it's going to be fantastic. And so I think as a process, as an industry, we've got to kind of embrace the idea, again, delete the old ways, embrace something new, test everything, test it early, and then iterate, okay? And move, and move it on.